All right, thank you so much for coming. This is the first time that I've been to the last week of the Rebecca Penance Festival, and there is definitely a sleepy vibe going on. <laughs> for sure. So let's see what we can do to wake you up a little bit this morning, these single parts. Um, today, I want to try, I'm sure we've all played this game, but I want to just play it a little bit uh, for now, for a certain point. Can you please tell me what this piece is from the very first note? Not a T sonata, yeah, for sure, okay? How about this one? Pardon me? Beethoven. Not pathetic, this was pathetic. What about this one? Could be it's true, but Opus 10 number one, exactly. Isn't that interesting what the same chord, just in a different place, means differently? Okay, different kind of things. For sure, as opposed to. Yes, it could be the Schubert, it's quite true. But for today, since we're talking about Beethoven, for sure. how about this one? Anybody know? Because everybody starts out that way, right? Before. Is that? Right, exactly. Okay, so we know these things. You know, it doesn't even require the harmony. What's this piece? Yeah. What's this piece? A passionate And that's a different C than this C. Um, harmonies really imprint themselves on us. They have something to say. They have something to mean. Okay? Harmony is really the seat of emotional meaning, I find. Um, and when we listen to Beethoven, especially, the reason why, I mean, I had a very long title for this lecture, and, and uh, Rebecca said, oh, that's too long. Let's just call it the face and soul of Beethoven, because that's really what I want to talk about. When we listen to Beethoven, the harmonies are where the meaning is in the piece. Yes, of course, there are certain motivic things, and the rhythm has meaning within the harmony, for sure. But harmony has such a powerful meaning that all you need to do is to hear it, and you know what's coming. Okay? And for Beethoven, it really is one of the fundamental things of his music making and musical understanding. It's his harmony. And when we hear Beethoven compose in C minor, my teacher, Mr. Presto, used to say that that's the key in which you see his face. Okay? That's his key, C minor. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about how that works in terms of harmonic meaning. It's the same way that we think about in language, actually. Think about it. You can take any word that you want, like the word mother. Okay? We all know what the word mother means. It's your female parent. Okay? But behind that is a certain sort of cultural understanding of what mothers mean, you know, warm and nurturing and caring, just kind of traditional in this sort of way. And even beyond that, there's a kind of understanding of how you feel about your own mother, which may or may not be warm and caring, you know, it depends upon that relationship, but there's a definite um, texture and layer of meaning and feeling to all these words. It's the same way with musical pitch. If you take an E, you know, we all know that that's an E, that's its definition. If we wanted to be scientific about it, we could measure the number of times it's vibrating and all that kind of stuff to pin down which E it is. But that's an E. We could even imagine that it's an E in the context of E major, that E sounds different from the context of E minor, or C major, or F sharp 7, or um, this E. Which I wish I could wrap up and give to my wife. It's just a beautiful, beautiful E. This way, so the E in its context means something different. Harmonies also have the same kind of difference of meaning. That C minor harmony here, which is the start of the pathetic or the Schubert C minor, sounds different when it's put up here. It sounds like a little kid in a way, even though it's just a few opus numbers different. So, harmonies are what I'm going to ask you to listen for. This is the 200th anniversary of the composition of 111 of Beethoven. Um, it's actually finished on the, the manuscript, he says he finished it on January 13th. Uh, you know, 1822. So, um, that's why I wanted to play for you, but one of them is a 26 minute long piece, the way that I play it, 
And it demands a lot of concentration all the way through. Not captivation. And I want to, to say that that's a big difference. We all know what it's like to watch a movie for two hours and to be glued to the screen or to get on Facebook and look up and suddenly it's been two hours and we've been there. That's captivation. That's something that is really captivating. 111 is not necessarily one of those pieces that captivate. It demands your concentration as you go through. And I want to talk about that. How to listen for his harmonies and what is meaning perhaps in the harmonies. Nobody says, you know, C minor means this or B flat major means this, although there are certain theories about where those come from in the Baroque times. And, and lots of pieces in B flat major seem very childlike, for instance, or very, very happy, and C minor seems very powerful. But these emotional meanings of harmonies are really up to you. And that's what I'd like you to engage with as we go through the piece. Um, I want to ask something before we start. And I always ask when I, I talk about this with Beethoven. Do you wish that Beethoven were not deaf? Yeah, I mean, nobody would, would want anyone to be deaf, for sure. Okay? But we got a lot of great music out of it, you know, that, that Beethoven was, couldn't hear. So the question then becomes, what did Beethoven hear if he can't hear the outside world? What is he listening to? The inner world. The inner world, yes. So you could say he's listening, pardon me? Oh, I'm sure he did. Right. So he probably could hear everything as just like he did for so many years. That's right, yes, and you have jumped the syllabus. That's my next, next <laughs> point, actually. But I don't know if he had lost hearing, where would he have gone? It's quite true, because he would have had, I mean, he was in touch with everybody else's music because he could read it from the score, as it were. But he missed all those kind of sensory yeah, things exactly. that we have. And so you know yourself when you're isolated that you tend to go in different places. Isolation is not necessarily good for us in some ways. Um, but what Beethoven is listening to is his soul. I have a friend, actually it's Emil Naumov at, at um, Indian University where Professor Plano teaches, who says all composers are deaf. They're not listening to what's outside, they're listening to what's in their heart, um, in a way. And that's probably very true. But Beethoven is really one of the first ones to say, I can't hear anything else. I'm going to listen to my soul and bring forth that, okay? And talk to you about what's going on in, in my heart. And this is a very, um, uh, ties in with some ideas from ancient times about music. Aristotle, we all know who Aristotle is, right? Writes in one of his books called Problematica. Um, he asks a question. He says, why is it that music, which after all is just pitches and rhythm, why is it that music so mirrors the state of the soul? So music really has a way of expressing what's in the soul. Also in, in Plato and Aristotle's view, it could affect the soul. If you wanted your children to be brave, you played them courageous music, for instance. And that's not lost upon composers these days either, when they're writing music for movies or commercials or anything like that. So I'd like you to, to engage with Beethoven's um, one another in that way. What is he trying to say from his soul? And how is he expressing that in his harmonies? 111 comes when Beethoven is 51 years old, and I think that it is expressing, or at least engaging with a, a problem that he's had all his life. Okay? Um, I don't know what the problem is, but I do recognize that there is a problem. When you play Beethoven, any Beethoven piece, we say you have to play all of Beethoven. You have to understand where that's going, where it has come from, what the implications are when he's writing in a certain because he tends to do similar things when he's writing in C minor all the way through his life, and I'll show you. Um, he tends to do certain things when he is writing the five piano concerto. When he writes a concerto, he writes in this kind of way. To the, um, one, one year I had um, all five concerti in my studio, and we got an orchestra together, and we played them. And I started to realize that in many significant ways, they're the same piece, each one of those concerti, okay, in some ways. And so what does it mean when Beethoven says, okay, in C minor, and then I may get to the five there while he's outlining this diminished seventh and so forth. That's from opus one number three, the piano trio in C minor. And of course some people say he's taking this from Mozart. <laughs> this 
sort of C minor progression, which highlights the third and also this diminished seventh. Okay. Beethoven takes that up in Opus uh, 1, number 3, as I said. In Opus 10, number 1, which is his next C minor piece. <laughs> And we would say, of course, that it is that third in the flat, in the natural. And that's what happens in the pathetic. That's the most exciting moment in that whole piece, as far as I'm concerned. That kind of right together, the E flat and the E natural. I'm skipping over lots of things which happen in Opus 10, number 1, which will become important in 111 later on. Things like um, uh, a move to D flat major in the, in the middle of the... Um, the recapitulation of that first movement. Things like at the end of the C minor um, uh, sonata opus 10 number one, he becomes, he goes into C major, and then that becomes the five of F major, which is the next one, opus 10 number two. He does a similar kind of thing at the end of the um, first movement of 111 and so forth. So these kind of things become important to him as he composes in C minor throughout his life. And the most maybe profound example is the C minor concerto, of course, where you have and then this, um, what is it? Firmly in C, right? And then what is his next? It builds up that diminished seventh again. And so forth. Same kind of harmonic progression. It's in this concerto where he decides, okay, I start out in C minor, and the thing which makes C minor, C minor is E flat, so I'm going to try E major on the second movement. You know, I should probably be using longer pedals according to the margin. You hear the E major at that point. How does he get back to C minor from E major? Four sharps to three flats? It's that E flat. <laughs> Because the second movement ends on an E major chord with a G sharp at the top and then the A. A flat, which is unharmonically G sharp minor. He gets back that way. It is no accident that in this concerto, after he's done a big C minor movement, a big E major movement, and then the last movement has a big A flat major section. What are the keys of 109, 110, and 111, which were composed at the same time? E major, A flat major, and then C minor, which becomes C major. I don't think this is a mistake, I think, or, or a coincidence. I think that Beethoven, all his life, has been thinking about what is this C minor, C major business going on, okay? So, I don't know what that means, what C minor means to him. I agree with my teacher that we see his face, okay, when he composes in C minor. I don't know what C major means, although it is true that almost all the time when he composes in C major, he writes allegro con brio, which means kind of with life, bubbly, um, he has a similar kind of thing, so C major must mean something to him. C minor must mean something. But I think that's our job as a performer and as a listener. What is he trying to say through these harmonies? What is he trying to express for us? And if we hear something uh, different in the harmonies, what are we learning about ourselves as we listen to the music speak to us? So, since 111 demands a bunch of concentration, I want to kind of take you through it a little bit. Uh, for those of you who don't know it, those of you who play it, I'm sure you don't need this, but um, the vast majority of us don't play 111, so I want to just lay it out for you. Um, it's only two movements long. The first movement is the shorter, okay? and then the second movement is like twice as long. The first movement starts out with a slow introduction, not coincidentally, it starts with an E flat before it outlines this diminished seventh here. And E flat, of course, is the crux of the matter. We're in C minor, it's got to have an E flat. That's how he starts. There are three uh, kind of diminished sevenths that you hear. You hear, and then you hear, and then goes to here. Um, so he has three diminished sevenths. That's important. Three flats in the key signature. Three diminished sevenths. Um, we go through a bunch of harmonies, which I hope that you will hear. Kind of revisit old friends and old feelings. Then something very important happens. We cadence in G. Almost immediately, Beethoven, who after all is very obnoxious, puts this right in our face. A flat to G. It's almost like, what's the important part here? G or A flat? Okay? And he deals with that problem that we hear all the way to the end of the, uh, the introduction. Emotionally in the piece all the way through. 
Um, the first movement is a very tightly organized sonata form. I don't have to explain that to you. There's a lot of uh, literature written how in the last three sonatas, Beethoven is combining improvisation with form. Okay? You'll hear that in this movement as well. He takes some time actually to... Um, <laughs> Lots of uh, tempo change, it's a deliberate tempo change, not just my own tempo change. Um, and basically, we get to the end of the, the movement, at which point he decides, well, I don't really like being in C minor, so I'm going to be in F minor. So we end in F minor with a kind of um, the last chord is a C major chord, but it's really ambiguous. It could be the dominant of F minor or could go on into C major, as he eventually does. Okay. The last movement really is the answer to all this turbulence. I think the C minor really represents a problem that Beethoven had throughout his life, and this could be any problem. It could be the problem of what is the difference between C minor and C major, that's highly musicological. It could mean that C minor is his way of expressing his um, um, determination, or his power, or his sense of unfairness, or something. I don't know what it is. I mean, he's writing this piece when he's 51 years old, and it's addressing problems in the same way as Opus 10 number one or Opus 1 number three. That's a long time to live with a problem. But those of us who have reached 51 years old realize that there are certain problems in life that don't go away from our earliest childhood. There are these things in us that we have to deal with. Beethoven's talking about that as well in, in these pieces. And the longer that you play 111, the more meaningful it becomes to you. In some ways, the second movement is the answer to the problem. Um, I should tell you that Beethoven was working on his mass at this point as well. Um, it took him a long time to complete the mass, and of course, uh, the mass is um, um, a great exposition of Christian doctrine, as it has been throughout, throughout all life. Beethoven was a Catholic, we know that, but his religious ideas were rather unorthodox for the time. I haven't researched them extensively, so I can't really tell you how they were unorthodox, but it's just um, kind of known that he wasn't a, a, a dogmatic Catholic in this sense. However, because he's working on the Mass, I do hear in the Arietta um, this theme and variations that come, I do hear certain um, echoes of the Christian liturgy or the Christian meaning or worldview in this. The first, I think, no matter what you think about that, the first theme. Interestingly, this kind of sound. 
sounds, which Beethoven could almost hear, is very typical in the deaf community because they like to hear low rumbling sounds. They hear the vibrations. Um, they can feel them, as it were. So you can feel that. This variation is very special because after Beethoven pants, after his exhaustion, we are taken up to heaven. variation, Beethoven um, sort of brings back the theme a little bit to remind us of what the original prayer was, okay, until we finally get the real answer, I think, after a series of triple trills, which is a, the moment of greatest exertion, greatest fervor, and greatest ecstasy in a way. Um, trills mean something very special for Beethoven, I find. They can, he was famous for his trills, okay, so he was showing off. But in this case, I don't think he's showing off. I think sometimes trills mean joy, sometimes they mean fun. In this case, it means exertion or the, the moment of greatest truth, in a way. And then after that, we, we finally get to a point where the hands are the farthest apart. someone who has been crucified, their arms are stretched out, in a sense. But also there's a point in the Bible where it says that God has put our sins as far away from us as east is from west. I can't help imagine Beethoven thinking about that kind of thing, you know, in the Mass and also in this, um, this place. And we get to the last variation, which is terribly beautiful, harmonic progression. from the throne of God and it is shallow at the beginning but becomes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper as it extends through time. And I find the same kind of imagery here in this variation until the very end we have really the answer of heaven, I think, to all of this imagery until we come to the very end and we find some peace. Beethoven, you will hear um, at the beginning of this movement by the end of the piece. Okay? So, that's my take on this movement, and it is a way to kind of orient yourself as you're going through. I don't think, since none of us know what Beethoven's meaning in these harmonies are, you certainly don't have to hear what I hear in the piece. But my point is that I would like um, to ask you to be listening with your heart as you, you, you listen to the piece. Because if you hear me play it and you hear something different, you say, oh, I think it should go differently this way, that's great. It actually means that you should play the piece. Because the, the, you're hearing from your heart, you're hearing what Beethoven is saying to you through these emotional harmonies. And that really, in the end, is why Beethoven wrote the piece. It was not meant for public performance. It was meant as a kind of letter to you about his condition and about what he thinks about our condition together. So I hope that's what you hear. That performance.
Great. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll look forward to our session soon.